work on uh, JCM is going to have a little bit of work on getting posting some of these things. So uh, maybe Peter, you can choose people to read if he's there. Otherwise, but how I'm here. You have to you have to repeat that because I'm. Uh, what were you asking, Jeff? If you could choose people to read, <clears throat> but uh, I'm going. I was going to have go or read the first round. But first, we're going to post this letter only because a lot of people don't get these emails and give them a little bit of background, but we don't need to actually read it. I think it'll be fine that people can, uh, who are just following the recordings, can just hold it on their screen and read it. Do you want me to read the letter, Jeff? No, I think no. uh, okay. we'll just basically, uh, the, but when we get into the next stri okay. the book itself. Got it. The one point is there, don't worry if you miss the session because each, it's not as sequential as a lot of books are. You know, each topic is almost like a facet of, of a diamond unto itself. What book <clears throat> is this? What's that? Effort. Oh, the Effort book, and Grace. Okay. The book is Effort and Grace. But let me just mention a few things. Oh, before we start, though, I'm going to just say a little bit of, <clears throat> for you people are all pretty much familiar with this, but uh, there are people who listen to the recordings from around the world who may not have any background. But anyway, I should say that, ba that Darwin began this book when he was 92 years old. Can you imagine? And sometimes he would just go over the typewriter and just start typing out some of these sections. And <clears throat> he lived till 97. He kind of basically completed it by about 90, when he was 96. But giving you some background of Darwin, he was he grew up in upstate New York and early on he felt the presence of Jesus you know he had the companionship growing up and he thought everybody else had the th the same experience because people were going to church and and he thought this was just a common experience but over time he found out that that wasn't the case but when he was 17 he went out west um, to Montana and Utah and everything. He worked as a cowboy, but under those incredible skies, and he was a contemplative as it was, he uh, had wonderful experiences. And at one point, it became clear to him that Jesus was on the earth again and that he would meet him. Uh, and you can imagine that. And he I think that he thought that it, that the date would be 1934. I'm not 100% certain on that. <clears throat> but he went back, he was just 17, and then he went back to uh, upstate New York, and he got married to Jean. <clears throat> and one day he was looking at his newspaper, and there was a little filler in the newspaper. They used to have fillers that when, when there weren't enough uh, uh, copy for a story and there were these little bits they would put in these little fillers and there was one in which it said that Meher Baba and a few of his disciples were coming to England of uh, coming to England and when he read that he thought this is the one he is the one and then later on news came that Bob was coming to America and Darwin went down to see Baba at Harmon on Hudson, this is 1932, and he missed Baba by a day. But he had incredible inner experience of Baba. And then just going to 1934, he was not going to miss Baba this time. So he was at the hotel <laughs> waiting for Baba in New York when Baba came off the boat and was brought to uh, this hotel. And Norena came in with with Baba and she saw Darwin and Jean and went over and, and said, you know, Baba, this is this Darwin and Jean Shaw. Baba held out his hand to Darwin 
and Jean, but he felt that hand came across 2,000 years. This was the Christ himself. And he had been much loved in his life, but he had never been loved this way unconditionally. And uh, he said from then on it was like reliving the pages of the New Testament, the experience. And so anyway, I met Darwin and Jean in 1970. That's another whole story. But their house was like the lagoon cabin. It was so full of love and with, with um, apple juice and cookies, you know. I mean, but it's like Baba and, and Darwin and Jean just hung out in this house, uh, you know, with each other 24 hours a day. I mean, I can imagine Baba going to houses throughout the world where there's nothing but problems, but here, Baba got to just rest. And, and but, <clears throat> so they had the culmination of their life with Bob with this, this glorious companionship. And a lot of us young people came. <clears throat> and Darwin was very unassuming. But we discovered that if we asked questions, uh, he had to answer. And so luckily he remembered all the stages he had to go through to get to this glorious companionship. And, and much of that is what formed this book over the years, all the questions we asked of him. And um, so anyway, uh, going back to this book, this is, I should say, this is one of the major approaches to Baba, but it's not the only approach. You know, there are other equally valid approaches. So we're talking about, this is more of a conscious journey inward to that companionship and that um, Darwin and Jean uh, enjoyed at their life. So what, now we don't have to go hurriedly through this. If you have any questions or examples from your own life, don't hesitate. So anyway, let's uh, go ahead and uh, Jay Seema, can you uh, put up the first bit and then hopefully uh, we'll have go or read. And, and like I say, don't hesitate to ask questions. Hey, Baba. <clears throat> the Divine Beloved. The perennial spring of imperishable sweetness is within everyone. Meher Baba. We have the door to the unlimited within us and the opportunity for infinite exploration within. The spiritual path is wide open for those who are ready to pursue spiritual values. We have to dare to plunge into the ocean of God's being. It is fascinating to discover the spiritual potential we could be enjoying. It can happen to us. And now is the most propitious time of priceless value due to the strong altaric influence of Meher Baba's advent. The precious beyond words. Avtar Meher Baba has been called the awakener. He says, I have come not to teach, but to awaken. I experience him as the divine beloved who has come as savior, Messiah, Christ, to awaken us from the dream of creation. He awakens us to the spiritual quest and removes the barriers to further progress in that quest toward reality. The wonder of who Meher Baba, the divine beloved really is and the sweetness of his love for us is precious beyond words. The pure sweetness and heavenly beauty of our beloved can never be described adequately in words because there are no words capable of revealing the glorious love that he really is. He is the source of divine love, which is constantly pouring out into all of creation. Meher Baba's divine love is infinitely powerful yet unimaginably sweet, tender, and personal. Divine love is penetrating, clear, and beautiful. It is also light, cheerful, and infinitely free. It is awakening, transforming, and liberating. Divine love conveys illumination, a penetrating knowingness. When one is exposed to this love, one experiences a great expansion of consciousness 
and the sanskaric hoard of impressions that normally keeps us captive is put aside. One feels liberated and finds oneself swimming in the ocean of light, love, and beauty. Divine love opens the heart center, which becomes the main means of communication with the beloved, releasing the spirit and arousing an intense love for him. When through his grace, some of the veils fall away, one beholds him with the eyes of the heart. The indescribable beauty of his love irresistibly summons the soul to adoration and union. It unites one with him, the divine beloved in the spirit. Divine love is total significance. It is total significance because it embodies reality, truth. Divine love is the entire significance of creation. Divine love is the purpose of life, the meaning of life, and it is our destiny. Beautiful. Okay. So, uh, anyone, <clears throat> anyone um, have something to, any questions or anything to the, <clears throat> that you have to say? I mean, it's magnificent, you know, he, he just, I mean, a lot of these things were just transcribed things that he said. And when he would get into an inspired state, and uh, this is the way he talked. So, and he was talking out of that great love. Yeah, that's what I noticed, Jeff. This seems to me to be a form of reportage. It's uh, notes from the field. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, here's what's going on for me, and um, it's just marvelous that he can communicate it in such. Um, sweet language and he was very encouraging he, i mean it th this is not some far off place you know we it can happen in us the more we kind of uh, remove the veils and the resistances and uh, the unworthiness and everything and <clears throat> and enter in more into that experience um <clears throat> Now, one thing that maybe at the outset, and I'd like to get your, anybody that wants to uh, weigh in on this, but one of the main words that Darwin talks about is getting to the realm of the spirit, to live in the spirit. Uh, <clears throat> what does the spirit mean, especially in relation to uh, the heart and the mind and the body? What What do you think Baba means by that because it's very integral to this whole book is is withdrawing into the spirit anyone want to venture out into that <laughs> I would say that the spirit is um, to me uh, the spirit is that which is unchanging, that which does not respond uh, and identify itself in response. So it is that, 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 that aspect of consciousness, I guess, I guess I don't know what the spirit is. I can only know like, the reflection of spirit, you know, my, um, my awareness of my consciousness, you know? Yeah, so, no, I mean, it's, it's worth trying to kind of get a little bit of a flavor of what that is. And we'll each peer, you know, whoever wants to try. And Peter, it, uh, Peter, are you there? Or shall I go ahead and call on people? Well, we definitely have Cindy. Go ahead. Sure. May I then? Can I speak for a moment? Yeah, go ahead. I'll let, ask Bob to do the talking for me now. I volunteered to do this a long time ago. And right now I'm in a very, very bitter place. 
And if I had more notice, maybe I could do it. But right now, I don't think I'm the person for the job unless there's no other person available. Yeah. I'll okay. pass right now. I'm very bitter. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. That's being the, everything's voluntary. Go ahead, Cindy. When, when that question about the spirit, what it brings up for me is a sense of just being free ever evolving, creative, being able to have my incarnated body, but to live from a place of vibrating optimism about all of the facets of humanity that come. I, I don't know that living from the spirit means never having bitterness or grief or sadness or anger, but it's not all of who I am. It's part of the creative juice of being human when I live from the level of my, my spirit, my, the part of my soul that's incarnated here. And um, there just always seems to be like more shall be revealed, no limitations moving forward. There is um, always delight to be had from that level. Beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Jeff, yeah. I think um, your question kind of uh, has maybe an embedded assumption that the spirit is a thing. And maybe the spirit isn't a thing. I mean, if you're talking about the Atma or the um, drop soul, or, you know, if you're looking for that, then it is a, a an intellect a, a, it's a construct it's a concept but you know I'm, I'm thinking about the discourse called the life of the spirit and um you know to create a dichotomy between what is the spirit and what is not the spirit you know i think that's an artificial construct i think that um the life of the spirit can be lived in one's body. You know, it can be lived in um, in daily life. So I don't know if I'm going to go along with the spirit being a thing or yeah. or it being an emotion or let's, it being a feeling see. or something like that. I, I'm not going to go along Josh, with it. Let's see what Josh has to say from Australia. Yeah, if I remember... I, I feel like he's probably got his own definition for it, but I don't, I don't ha haven't kind of call enough to remember what it is. Cause I know the, the ancient Egyptians had like about eight different kinds of spirit. You know, they had the little bird head part of you that died and all these different things. So it, yeah, I'm really, so I basically, I don't know, but um, if I remember correctly, isn't it something like the, in, the intuitive emotional self is that what he is that what he means by it? I don't know. Basically, yeah. but. Well, I'll get. Uh, well, let's go with Kelvin. See what she uh, has to say from Asheville. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. Um, I think. Well, what I what I think from the time that I spent um, with him with Darwin and reading and rereading his book, it feels like he's talking about the quality of the heart, not so much the body or the mind heart, but that eternal place that is gentle and curious and open. And I wanna know what you have to say, Jeff. Yeah. Well, I'll say a little bit. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is kind of what I gathered from Darwin, that the realm of the spirit is it's beyond time and space, but and it's the love, it's the source of the love of beyond time and space, but it expresses itself through the heart, through the mind, through the body. You can be, uh, you, you can be like, um, I mean, it's possible to have your, your spirits feel good even though you're in a lot of pain and suffering. 
it's, it's kind of behind our personality self. But it's, um, and like I say, it expresses itself in time and space, but it in itself is beyond time and space. Like the, the moon, you, you, if you look at the moon, that, the moon is not the source of love. You know, you know, you won't find the source of love in the, of light in the moon. It, it's a reflective. So the heart and the mind and the body are vehicles for the love that's in the spirit. And of course, it loses a lot of its, um, by the time my love goes through my body or my emotions and my heart, it, it loses a lot of its pristine quality. Uh, and that's, that's, it gets better. We become a little bit more of a vehicle over time. But it's, it's, it's from the, a different dimension coming into this dimension. But anyway, I just, that's, I didn't want to say too much, but I just, uh, oh, well, 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 let's go for it here. Go for it, Patty. Yeah, um, I you said you were saying what I was thinking, uh, really a little bit about that, Jeff. I also came to mind um, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, and I was thinking it is the connection to the infinite everything that that does come through us that inhabits a form, and and the drop soul would be a piece of that oceanic beingness of in, infinite limitlessness of the divine presence of the one in the many. So uh, it, that's how I see it. And I believe that he had a, Darwin definitely had a connection where that was alive and thriving and a resource to his experiences from what I can tell reading the book several times sure. with you guys as well. So, you know, it's, it's to open our awareness to that greater part of our source that comes through us. So, Jay Baba. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, well, we'll see what uh, Robin is and then we'll go back to the book. Yeah. Well, I don't have much to add. Everybody, what everybody has said feels kind of like what I'm thinking of too. And I just want to add like the word essence um, I had like an experience where I realized that <clears throat> what that I have an essence that's the same exact essence that's in everybody, the all that is. Yeah. And just like the life force of the consciousness that's behind everything. And that's what we all have. That's what we all are. And then we have all this way that we, you know, manifest and, and limit ourselves so we can go through this experience. But it's just that all that is that's running through everybody and everything. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, Linda from Oregon. Whoop, uh, you're muted. Hi. There Sorry. you are. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've been on. I have a question, and it, um, it, hopefully it'll be a simple thing. Um, it, in the, um, on the, the first full paragraph on page four, um, the paragraph that starts, divine love conveys illumination. The second sentence, when one is exposed to this love, one experiences a great expansion of consciousness and the sanskaric horde of impressions that normally keeps us captive is put aside. Does, does that mean that there are times that we live outside of our sanskaras? I mean, I would say that absolutely we, not. Yeah. We get we get a, 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 a not on the heavier side of them, but on the lighter side of them, where more of the 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 light that's within us shines on on our sanskaras, so they're not as heavy as when we're in a bad mood and we're down in you know, entrenched. So, yeah. Okay. That's what I always thought too. Yeah, and sometimes you can feel like, boy, a light is a feather. And then the next day you feel heavy. So what, ha what's the difference, you know? <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. 
Well, this uh, a friend of mine, um, some of you might know Renata Moritz, she's a German woman, and she she feels that there are times in her artistic endeavors that she literally steps outside of Senskaras. And it's so, possible. She becomes like a vehicle for the yeah. creative spirit within. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank you for the input. Yeah. Darwin used to say, don't think of yourself so much as a base of operations. Think of yourself as a conduit. Think of yourself as a vehicle. And the spirit and the creative t creativity and love come through you more or less unobstructed. And of course, we it has to come through our son's scars, but uh, the, the more the spirit, uh, say, eclipses our son's scars, the better a piece of art or music or whatever comes through, you know. <clears throat> oh, good, we got Seattle here. Yeah, Jay Baba Jeff and everyone. Uh, so let me read uh, two short things that Baba himself said about spirit and what Adi Kehrani also said. Um, this is from Baba. The soul always remains the same. It is only the spirit which reincarnates and takes successive possession of bodies. People do not understand what spirit is and, and only vaguely use the term. There are so many terms used for one aspect. The soul is infinite, everlasting and pure. At present, you do not realize the soul and your mind means everything to you. Yet the mind is not you, it is what clothes are to the body. You are not the mind that feels and experiences everything. You are not the ego, you are the soul. Until it is realized, the spirit has to reincarnate and change bodies. You change your clothing when it becomes old and so it is with the body. You all have had so many bodies. Yet your soul never changes. It is the spirit which reincarnates again and again until you go back to the source of all, Baba. And this where is, is that? Where is that from? Oh, I'm sorry, Meher. Uh, that is from Lord Meher, and I think it's from some other books too. But uh, and this is from Adi Kedani from Just to Love Him. We have a physical body, we have our desires which are full of energy and which stem from our subtle body. We have our mind which Meher Baba says is the mental body and we have a soul at the back of it all. The soul is absolutely detached from all this, but it has two aspects. Somebody needs to be muted. The soul in relation to the mental body, the soul in relation to the mental body, the subtle body, and the physical body, which we call a human being, has experiences. It is called the spirit. The other aspect of the soul, the real nature of the soul, is absolutely detached. This is the difference between the soul and the spirit. And I do not think anybody except Meher Baba has explained this. Jeff, can, do you know who's making all that noise? Like everybody's muted. I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, but now it's gone. <clears throat> now it's gone. Um, can I have this question to Mayher? Yeah. Mayher, can you paraphrase that, please? So the soul, the spirit is different than the soul. The soul is pure essence, but the spirit is what comes and reincarnates. Is that what you said? Kind of? That's what Baba said. That oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the essence of what you were, what you were reading? Yeah. The sense seems to be that it's the spirit that reincarnates and the soul never really changes. Oh. oh, I mean, what Baba gave a definition back in the 30s that the soul is untouched by creation and the spirit 
is the soul when it interfaces with creation. Yeah, the oh. false self, the false self. It so. Uh, I see. Yeah, I mean, but they're linked up. But anyway, now let's go back to the book. I just thought, you know, to kind of ponder this a little bit, because we're going to run across this word, uh, word a lot. Okay, let's see. How about um, how about Bob reading? Bob Yeager. Yeah. Okay. Chapter two: Mayor Baba's work project. We all have the same destiny to realize our own divinity, our own godhood, and be free of the ego. The problem is to raise the consciousness and at the same time abolish the ego. Darwin Shaw. My belief is that we can get closer to the goal of life by consciously striving for it with the master's help. All the explanations that Meher Baba has given through the discourses and other books are for the purpose of leading us toward divine love, toward actual merging with God. We are Baba's work project, and this is his work with us. Meher Baba asserts that in truth, everyone is God, but that we are unconscious of our Godhood. The truth is latent within us, but it must be awakened. We must become conscious of it. To realize consciously what we already are unconsciously, we have to become free of the false self, the ego. And I believe that this is accomplished through our own efforts and through the intervention of the Master's divine grace. Mayor Baba is working to raise our consciousness from the dual realm, which means that he is opening doorways to increasing inner freedom. He redirects our consciousness toward the truth and urges us to take our stand upon the truth within and work toward it ourselves instead of lingering unnecessarily long in the dream of illusion. He works on our behalf to destroy the veils that cloud our consciousness from the truth. And this brings us salvation of the spirit, freedom that is experienced at the level of the spirit. He has come to take us beyond the opposites and to help us get free of them as we go through life. He has come to release us from the bondage of time-bound illusion. Then we are no longer subject to the world and its opposites. We find lasting inner freedom and true happiness within, far beyond the dual realm. That is what Baba means when he refers to the inner happiness of God realization. I feel that Mayor Baba's work of freeing us from our false self and the illusory creation is still going on and will continue to go on as a part of the work of the avatar. I believe that knowingly or unknowingly, we are all participants in a divine design unfolding toward our spiritual potential, our own godhood, and a small thing it is to ask of us that we should help in getting ourselves free. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> so any anything to say there to what Darwin has said? Well, you know, I mean, to, to me, it has so much to do with when Baba talks about dismantling the roof that we all build over our over ourselves that prevents his light from getting in, I mean, he's talking about the effort that we have to make. And though, as Darwin is talking about in this section, I certainly can't do that on my own. I mean, in in. <laughs> In the final accounting, it's grace that does the job. But without, without trying, without making some some efforts to get, you know, to what does Baba say? The war against the lower self is the only war that is really worth fighting, and uh, you know, which is essentially 
tearing down all the stuff that separates me from Baba and 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 praying for his grace. But but it somehow, paradoxical as it may seem, it requires both of those things. So I <clears throat> Yeah, it's um, yeah. The our, our efforts draw his grace, but then our efforts are kind of inspired by his grace. It's it's all comes around eventually. People see it was all done by Baba, but uh, we may not be at that stage where we can actually see. We're doing stuff from his our side, and he's doing stuff from his side. <clears throat> Anything, any <clears throat> when else? I'd like to share. Yeah. I think now, you know, I was blessed to be part of this group during full shutdown, lockdown, that as I'm exploring just this now in this energy, that I see how easy it is to be hoodwinked by the opposites, especially of right and wrong, even when interpreting these words. And the energy, like what I noticed in myself, even in the discussion so far, is it getting a rise of of I would say getting invested in duality with the absolutely this or absolutely not that, and then trying to figure out from my mind, what is the vein? And then I just have to laugh because this is all about the experience of freeing myself up to be in communion with God, what I get out of effort and grace. And so I'm delighted to see how my personality can still get um, seduced into the illusion of right and wrong, even with spiritual di discourse, and that the truth is latent within us and we get to have it awakened and that Baba is helping us um, destroy the veils that cloud the consciousness from the truth. And the truth is not an opposite of yes or no, or this or that. It's um, beyond even words that I can share, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling delighted to see that part of myself that would get embroiled in it, which is fun. That's part of the game. And then just to take a deep breath and remember that divine love is total significance and there's no opposites in that. Thank you. Beautiful. Well said. <clears throat> yeah. Meher <clears throat> Prasad. Yeah, I think the key thing that really occurs to me in this is the, is the thing that Darwin says where and Baba is redirecting our consciousness to himself. I think that is the key thing is whenever we think of him, our consciousness is directed towards him and that's what he uses um, to free us from everything. That, that is what I have realized is that the more we think of him, the more he can use, um, you know, um, his work to basically free us from everything that we are caught up in. And I believe that the Sahaj Dhyan that Baba talked about is also basically directing our consciousness towards him as much as we can. And the rest, he takes care of it. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, it's Darwin always talked about withdrawing the uh, conscious, the withdrawing our awareness or consciousness, the tentacles of awareness from being uh, caught up in all these wants and things that we like of the world, so that that consciousness drops back more into the realm of the spirit. <clears throat> and so his, where his presence becomes uh, more important than our own presence, uh, eventually. In other words, we... Uh, his presence is more attractive than just following our pre own presence all the time. Go ahead. Anybody? I was, no, I was just going to ask Jeff. It's March. I was going to ask him. So is, is, so is that an effort? I mean, is it, I, I, I'm getting caught up um, with, I mean, I, if we make an effort, that's just the ego making an effort. It seems like the only thing that isn't get totally demolished by ego is if I just keep thinking of Baba, and that's an effort, but 
like if there's another effort to, you know, as soon as I want to make an effort to do something, then I get into what Cindy was talking about. Oh, that's good. Uh, I'll make an effort. That'll please Baba. See, so then I kind of get caught up then with that. Oh, that's, that's, a, Baba would be happy with that. But that's a judgment of my ego. Well, making an effort towards doing something good. Well, and I, I go ahead. Not necessarily. I mean, your efforts can be inspired by love or they can be inspired by good and bad and right and wrong and by your ego. But, well, I, I mean, we have to distinguish, is this, are, are these efforts being inspired by the love in me or, or by Baba's love? So not, not all of efforts are, are selfish or have that self-interest in it, you know, and <clears throat> otherwise we'd, we wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> Uh, anything, anyone else? Or shall we go on to the next uh, section? Okay. It's on... Um, oh, yeah, somebody... Uh, Marion, how about you? To begin reading? Yeah. Is, is it with layers of the cake? Yeah. All right, thank you. Layers of the cake. Mayor Baba refers to the gradual effacement of the false self as, quote, the progressive conquest of the unconscious by the conscious, quote. This means that the goal of life, simply stated, is to make our unconscious minds conscious. However, between the unconscious and the conscious resides the subconscious, and this is where our central problem lies. The unconscious, subconscious, and conscious layers, sorry, sorry the unconscious, subconscious, and Conscious are layers of consciousness, layers of the same cake. The obstacle we have to contend with is the reg residue of sanskaras, deposits of impressions accumulated from past experiences, embedded mostly in our subconscious minds. These sanskaras create veils over our consciousness blocking us from the awareness of who we really are. Each one of us has amassed a unique set of sanskaras due to our own particular experiences. In the discourses, Meher Baba explains the evolution of consciousness in great detail. Here, I will only say that the whole purpose of it during which consciousness was chiseled, hammered, and brought into being through suffering, pleasure, and all of the opposites, was to evolve consciousness. Once we have achieved creation consciousness as human beings, our consciousness is complete, and we are equipped to experience the unconscious the oversoul, consciously. However, because of our sanskaric veils, we are conscious only of creation and of ourselves as being limited. We have the means of being aware of who we really are, but we go on using our fully evolved consciousness to experience the illusory creation the gross world, which was merely the means to the end, when the end, full consciousness, has already been achieved. That is our predicament. We have become addicted to the creation. We perpetuate our own bondage by continuously accepting what our sanskaras impel us to think feel and do. 
sanskaras give rise to false thinking, which in turn creates the passing illusory drama we take to be reality, causing us to remain ignorant of the one reality, our true identity. That is why Meher Baba says, quote, the problem of deconditioning the mind through the removal of sanskaras is therefore extremely important. Close quote. Instead of using our consciousness to express our sanskaras by pursuing more pleasures, excitement, and experiences in the gross world, Baba says that we should turn our consciousness inward toward the reality and begin to explore in that direction. Beautiful. <clears throat> Anything to say to that, folks? It Martha. So that last line, Baba says that we should turn our consciousness inward toward the reality and begin to explore in that direction. Oh, what would that look like? Well, I mean, it would be like... Um, Meditation. Who, yeah. who is that person that's speaking? I don't see, I don't see who it is. Well, my name is Christina. Oh. Christina. Oh, under Baba family? Yeah, I just, I logged in before anybody else and I logged in as a host and then I transferred the host. So it Oh, okay. I wondered who was speaking. I couldn't tell. Okay, thank you, Christina. Yeah. Um, now, what was what were we talking about here? Oh, I was going to ask on that last sentence. Baba says that we should turn our consciousness inward toward the reality and begin to explore in that direction. And I asked, oh, what would that look like? Like repeating Baba's name, well, like that. It, I mean, uh, taking it in a general way. Uh, after a while, you get fed up with life. You're not going anywhere. You want something deeper, something richer, uh. you want more love, <clears throat> and you're not. You discover you can't just get it out there. You're not getting much of it. So you you turn within, and you start to discover <clears throat> where the love is coming from. In other words, there's um, a line from Rumi where he says, uh, with a basket of freshly baked bread on your head, you go from door to door begging for a few dry crusts. Eventually, you just say, hey, it's, hey, that might be on me, in me. And so you turn within. And it's a natural process. And of course, part of that is remembering Baba, Baba's name, going to Baba places, reading, you know, all the various things we do to turn our, getting our consciousness more on the, the timeless and, and spacious rather than on the cramped time and space world. <clears throat> Marion. Uh, oh, thank you. I, this is a sharing because this is so dear to my heart. What you describe, I call tools in the toolbox, <laughs> Jeff, you know, yeah. and everybody is so different in individual. So that's why I don't, put what I do onto somebody else, but to share in that spirit that delights me in that in this incarnation, I tend, my personality tends to be kind of a sensate person. Like what's what's in front of me, the five senses, that's what I take as real. And so my task, not a task, my joy has been to go to the other side of that chart and uh, use my intuition, develop it more. Not develop it more, but bring more. And Baba has that in the discourse, you know, that we're here to balance the head and the heart with the heart leading the way that is intuition and that is God. So that's been a lot of what my journey is. And so to do that, I've had to look at, as what Baba also says, we're here to bring the unconscious to consciousness. So I have my six areas of my life. There's probably hundred areas, but I use six, you know, like, you know, money, work, spirituality, my apartment, like six areas of my life. And when I sometimes in 
my meditation or contemplation, I'll look at those areas and see what do they reflect back to me that I believe, that I'm holding in, in a belief that creates that outwardly. So when, to me, when I read that, it's about me going inward. It's very individual to me and what works for me. And I yet I find having those tools in my toolbox helps me a lot to look at my outer life to see, hey, you know, what kind of beliefs have I have in there? What's my unconscious creating out of my unconscious? So that's it. It's my yeah. sharing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Marion. Yeah. They're tapping into some of the uh, the deeper things here. Anthony from Florida. Hey, hey J. Bob, everyone. Um, yeah, I, it, just the way Baba has been teaching me about this one, a, a lot of my outer activities that I, I used to really try to do to like, um, you know, really milk a lot of pleasure out of, I mean, even things, you know, like where I live driving out two hours out to the beach to try to get that feeling of expansiveness out there and going on these little trips here and there and, you know, trying to take my little boat to the river. And I mean, nothing that's that, you know, terrible to do, but I would go do these things a lot and and have these like pain in the butt experiences like driving all the way out to the beach and the weather would be ridiculous or the crowds would be nuts and I I wasn't getting the experience I I would thought thought I would get out there and then you know I'd get out to the river and then the you know the motor wouldn't start on the boat right and then this going on and it, these things kept happening a lot and then I I'd get back home you know, and I would, um, you know, I would read something of Baba's or even start getting on the internet and like looking at some pictures of the ocean and meditating on it. And I was like, God, I, I really feel better sitting here trying to experience these things within, you know, through guided imagery or, and I don't know that, that started this realization of that pursuing it within is always so peaceful and centering and as I'm running around physical space everywhere to, you know, go drive here and do this and do that, just how how much of a pain in the butt it would turn into a lot. And it just slowly started dawning on me how fulfilling it was to just relax in your own home and try to go to those places within through poetry and, you know, through taking Baba there in, in the imagery of these places so I don't know. I'm definitely not an expert on it yet, but it it's definitely been this massive shift of realizing the gratification of trying to travel to places within through, you know, poetry and imagery and, and you know, bringing Baba into it versus trying to like run all over the physical earth everywhere to get these beautiful experiences that a lot of times don't end up being what you thought they were going to be. And, and I, I really feel Baba was purposely making a lot of those experiences mess up to force me to have to realize like, yeah, you shouldn't be, you know, you should be going here within because you can go there at any time as much as you want. And the real freedom is going to be there. So beautiful. Yeah. Very descriptive. And that uh, kind of answers what Marta was saying, you know, that, that shift that you wind up. But we used to try to take Bao Kao Chiri to see things. He didn't want to see anything. Lake Tahoe or, you know, uh, the, the ocean and everything. <laughs> he like, you know, you know, I don't need to see those things. I mean, let's talk about Baba. That was his thing. Anyway, <clears throat> anything else, anyone else to bring? Up. Well, why don't we go on to the uh, the next thing? Jay Seema, wonderful that he's able to bring this stuff up. And oh, now I can't see. How, uh, Patty, how about your reading? Sure, be happy to. I don't know whether to read out of my book or here. Um, I'm going to read out of my book, but thank you for the screen. Uh -huh. For ages, we've been addicts to illusion, but have not realized it. In prison, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. For ages, we've been addicts to illusion, but have not realized it. In prison, but have not known it. 
We've been dwelling in semi-darkness when, by a little effort, we could be dwelling in the light. For, fortunately, there are mecha mechanic mechanisms Mechanic. mechanisms <laughs> that are built into the whole creations process that will eventually impel us to conclude that the only important goal is realizing truth and that everything else is a hallucinatory nightmare. These mechanisms include periodic revelations or awakenings given by the master. But the primary mechanism is the natural maturing process. Our many lifetimes of experience whereby we naturally turn to the spiritual path. And this process involves disillusionment. We are like a mule a fellow is negotiating to buy. Does he obey, the buyer asks the owner? Oh, sure, the owner replies. Show me, the buyer demands. The owner then picks up a big stick and starts beating the mule over the head. Hey, what are you doing? cries the buyer. You said, does the mule obey? He does, says the owner, but first you have to get his attention. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mayor Baba tells us that the logic of experience gathered through many lives drives everyone sooner or later to the spiritual path. Actually, he says, several lives. But I think, that for the vast majority of us, it has taken many lives. This inner logic derives everyone to, to the spiritual path because we learn after a while that by continuing in the realm of desires and gross thoughts and gross actions all the time, we ourselves are creating the conditions that will cause us to reincarnate again and again. Beautiful. Do you want me to stop there? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything to say to that? Looks like Martha Maltz is... Basha? We can't hear you, though. And we just... Oh, um, <laughs> I kind of spaced out at that last second. <laughs> Can you just repeat? I just went off somewhere. It's like... uh, well, it's talking about the logic of experience that after a while, eventually you say there's got to be more to life than this. And then we start... definitely. And I was thinking about what um, the person said from Florida. I forgot his name that pretty soon you don't really want to run around everywhere. You find that everything is within, you know, like, and that, just being he here and meditating and listening to your heart, you experience stuff. You don't, your spirit and your soul to me are, you're, we're all the same soul, I believe, you know, and that our spirits, you know, I'm just going off. I'm not going <laughs> to, I don't have my thoughts together. Yeah. Yeah, but what you said is is very good. You know, it's it's we're we're driven to go deeper within. Bob. Well, I'm here. You know, I, I've been here on the center, and then I'm in the woods, and you know, I want to go back to the center, and I say, why do I have to go back when I want to be right where I'm at right now? Instead of running all over, I'm just trying to just be in the moment and not listen to what's going on in the gross world because. I find out that it could make me paranoid if I, I, I'm safer just being with Baba, you know, and like reading and painting and, and trying to detach from all that because that's my an illusion trying to, you know, it's upsetting. So I have to trust Baba that he'll take care of it and it's all happening for a reason. And always, I always say Baba like a gazillion times when things come in that I don't want to think about, you know or paint or listen to music. So I'm kind of in my own bubble, <laughs> but I, you have to stay attached to the world too, you know, but I'm like in the middle of three different places. It's like weird. <laughs> I'm going through some weird stuff. Yeah. 
But you keep returning again and again to Baba with your painting, with your remembrance of him, uh, and not get too far out into the world, which may not be that nourishing. Well, I think we're just Baba's living through our us. I mean, like when I rub when I put cream on my feet, I imagine that I'm rubbing Baba's feet or anybody that has sore feet. It's getting really weird. You know, it's like I feel like we're just vehicles for Baba to do his work, you know. Beautiful. Yeah. Let's see what Bob. Well, I just the, the, this sort of reminded me of the last section we read. The um that process of bringing the subconscious into consciousness so that one can deal with it. That, that's not a pleasant process. I mean, all of that stuff that's in the subconscious, um, Darwin just said, and Baba says, that has to come up. So you can, you can deal with it consciously, make conscious choices, you know, to do or not do. And sometimes being Sometimes being, you know, in, in the world around people in difficult situations is the very thing that brings that stuff up. All those reactions and judgments and, you know, different personalities and all of that stuff that, 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 that has to be dealt with. I mean, otherwise it just stays buried. So. Yeah, excellent. That's it. It would be so much easier if there weren't these other people, you know. <laughs> no. People, are, I mean, we are serving each other by, I mean, I don't mean to, you know, you don't want people, you don't want to go out and push people's buttons, but just being yourself can often push people's buttons and they, yeah, up, you're, you're triggering their subconscious and they're triggering your subconscious. And it's all, uh, it's all awakening us, even though it seems like it's, unnecessary but it really well, is well how about when you go out you're secluded and then you go out into the world and all of a sudden you see different people from every walk of life in front of you right and it's like watching a movie you know what i mean and then you kind of go run back home and say wow what was all that you know it's yeah. like and then when you go to the center you're here and you feel like you're in this magic force and then all of a sudden you're forced out and you go on the airplane and you're like back in this other place and then you realize that it goes with you you know you don't have to leave it but it's you have to really kind of stay away from people for a while because you get kind of out there <laughs> yeah eventually i mean that what darwin has said you get an abiding presence of baba which goes with you everywhere and whoever you're with and all that you, it's strong enough that inner presence is stronger than the outer presences they get dissolved. The, the inner presence dissolves a lot of the outer presence. So it's not so disturbing. But yeah, goer. <clears throat> yeah, this one line caught my um, attention mostly. But the primary mechanism is the natural maturing process. Our many lifetimes of experience whereby we naturally turn to the spiritual path. And this process involves disillusionment. Now that I find um, I've gone through in my own life. And uh, it's so true that when you think about experiences that you go through that bring you nothing but you know disillusionment, it goes to bringing you that much closer to Baba. Because you realize at that point that this life is is nothing but you know it, it's a, it's a passing show it's it's temporary it's it's not reality mm -hmm. but again you're going through the experience you're you're experiencing the pain you're experiencing this the whatever you know negative uh things that you're going through um so it, it just brings brings you more forcefully into baba's uh, presence it brings you the real the real the realization that he is there always he will always be there he will never let you down he is your friend he will always pick you up um, he will always carry you with him he he is the permanence whereas all this is temporary so it brings it that much more into uh, focus so that's what i wanted to share yeah amen <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. Um, any 
Anything else? Should we lead, read one more? We'll read one more passage. And then uh, we'll, we'll call it a day. You know, what Darwin is doing is he's laying out just kind of the large view of things. Then it's going to get, he'll, he'll get much more specific. Oh, let's see. Uh, Mayor Prasad, will you, you have your book there? Yeah, I can read. A dream within a dream within a dream. Our lives may seem to be long and meaningful, but truly life is very short. We all have to drop our physical bodies someday. Then what happens? We go through a transitional period and after a while we come back into another body and do, and do the same thing all over again. Meher Baba has told us many times that we are addicted to a mere dream, within a dream, within a dream. We argue with that because this life seems so real to us. He then explains that when we are asleep and dreaming, we have that same feeling of realness. But when we wake up, we realize that it was a dream after all and that our feelings in the dream were just transitory and of no consequence. And that is the way our lives are. After ages and ages, the dream of illusion eventually becomes a nightmare for the soul. We finally experience so much disillusionment that we get fed up with being enslaved at the gross level and all those temporary things are no longer a lure, an attraction for us. Then we turn to the heavens, we turn within, we turn to God, we turn to the Beloved and cry out, What am I doing here? Isn't there something more? What is it all about? What is real? Eventually, after numerous incarnations, we become mature enough so that we can start to withdraw our consciousness from its attraction to the world and begin the involutionary path toward inner freedom. This is the spiritual path toward reality, toward God. It is an unfolding process a natural process of growth, of maturity, of refinement. In other words, we are growing. Anything to say to that? One thing about Darwin, he was very encouraging. We're going to, we are moving toward this. I mean, this is our future and, and you can imagine how we were 40, 50 years ago and where we have move to since then. Things that used to bother us and, and drive us crazy don't even touch us anymore. And ideas we had about ourselves, we've, uh, inferiority, we've thrown a lot of that off. So it's, Baba is working on his side full time, uh, you know, around the clock. And we are drawing closer and closer to our own inner so our soul and the divine love within it. But anyone have anything <clears throat> to say? <clears throat> Jeff, can't it also be, um, isn't it kind of a trap to, to think we're growing? Isn't that just a, <clears throat> you know, you know what I'm saying? I know you do. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a long time where you get a feeling that you're growing and then eventually you kind of discard that. You try to try to not exist. 
But why? I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> it, but it, you know, you, it, that sense that you're moving and going somewhere is necessary for the heart. Until it is. Yes, I think so. The fact that you're becoming more loving, you're becoming more generous, you're becoming more patient, you're becoming more forgiving. All those things are victories uh, for the for love in us, you know. And, uh, you know, what the beautiful thing that Baba says is all the development we do in, in this lifetime, all of our spiritual uh, work that we've done to be more patient, to be uh, more uh, loving, to be uh, care more for others, all of that, you, you, that's, you pick that up in your next life. You don't, you don't have to start all over again. So we are, as we're going along, we are, we are becoming more loving. We're moving deeper and deeper into the love that we actually are. So, uh, so improving in that way, I, I think, and Darwin would say, is a good thing, is a healthy thing, that we're becoming more loving. But eventually, um, I'll tell you one thing <clears throat> that, that, that there was one guy in <clears throat> uh, in India. I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, a guy named Craig Ruff, and he was working <clears throat> at the trust early on. He was there. He worked there for about fifty years, practically. But he was working <clears throat> at, uh, on this project with uh, the the trust, and early on, and he presented his work and everything like that. And nobody in the trust, the trustees, did not respond <laughs> at all to what he what he put his heart into. And he was like really hurt and humiliated. And afterwards, he he was with Erich. He said, "You know, Erich, that was humiliating. I, I mean, to have to to go through that." And er, now this is this is like to say this PhD level. Erich said. How can you be humiliated when you don't even exist? <laughs> but that, that I mean, so eventually that self-improving and everything and humiliation and doing better is a good up to a certain point, but eventually, like Darwin said, sooner or later you discover you're nobody and that is not an unhappy discovery. But until then, Dar Darwin used to talk about you have to build up the ego and then make the decision to ask Baba to have it dismantled. You know, uh, I don't know if that meant, but he was big on that, that some people are in the process of getting their ego strengthened to where they have the courage to say, okay, Baba, now you can dismantle it. And that's when you become nobody, <laughs> eventually. Well, okay, Janet from Colorado here. Hey, Baba, everybody. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm a little bit, I have confusion about is how we withdraw from the world and realize that that's not where our, that's not going to be what uh, in the end gives us um, satisfaction or it, it, it isn't satisfying shall we say, but at how do we, but we still, how do we at the same time participate in the world? And I mean, you know, because I, I my understanding is that Baba isn't asking us to crawl into a cave and be totally, I mean, most of us, maybe it's fine for some, but to crawl into a cave and be entirely um, separated from the world, like was, you know, yogis of past times, but we're, we want to, he wants us to be uh, working in the world and bringing consciousness into the world. And so what's confusing to me is how do we do that and, and maintain this, you know, how to be in the world and not of it, I guess, yeah. is the question. Yeah. Beautiful. That we bring that up. Yeah, I mean, it's like, and other people might want to chime in on this too, but as as we go within, we get a more love, and the love is what 
<clears throat> helps us interact with the world and others. You know, it's not like you just get go in and you feel this love and then you just keep it to yourself. But you're going in, but you're not in, interacting with the world with your lust, greed, anger, jealousy, and everything like that. You're interacting with the world with love. But you're getting love first before you go out, um, uh, <clears throat> go out into the world, so to speak. L love kind of protects you uh, from from the negativity of the world. <clears throat> But, uh, but yeah, it's not like kind of going into a cave, hanging out with Baba, because Baba is in others. But love is our link to Baba. I don't know if that makes sense. But anyway, someone else answered that too for Janet. Um, Jeff, can I just say it's, yeah. as Baba says, you have to be in the world, but not be off it. In other words, be detached. Do, do whatever your normal life leads you to do, but in, within yourself, think that it is Baba doing it, not you. And therefore you are detached from it. And therefore it does not affect you. I hope that helps. <laughs> That's how I deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the detachment that is the key, I think. Yeah. And, the, and the heaviness of the world doesn't stick to your love. Yes. It's like a Teflon. You know, <laughs> and and I, if I may speak, um, the illusion is the separation, the separation from God, the separation from Baba, and so as I approach more and more being one with Baba, as I approach it more and more, I become more love. And that expressing that union out in the world is the realization of union. The more I see with Baba's eyes, the more I feel with Baba's heart. That's what I, that's what I try to practice. The more union I experience, the more I become that. So it's an opportunity. Challenges are an opportunity to be more love and um and i kind of refuel at home in the <laughs> quiet <laughs> and on zoom and with reading that's where i refuel and i i i must i i must and um so it, it's kind of joyful doing it that way because I feel more union and um, yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said, Betty. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, the la this is the last last thing and then we'll have a moment of silence. Or well, maybe if someone has a nice quote and then we'll have a moment of silence. Robin. <clears throat> um, I think it's really helpful to hear everybody's um, description and and thoughts and everything of how they're coming going about this trying to the effort part um but i also think it's like for me it's i try not to um think that like there's a particular way to do it it's like each moment um like you know what somebody else might feel like they're going going in a cave or going within or being in the world it's like it's a time and a place for everything and it seems like a process that just uh to stay aware of what you need at the time or how you're going to go about it it's instead of like a, a prescription in any right. way yeah excellent yeah yeah kind of like let's see what the moment is prompting 
us to do, you know? Because, I mean, I'd like to take a helicopter and go to the top. I feel like I know how to, like, I should know how to do this already. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, why am I holding, what, you know, he says, like, we're doing this. We're staying veiled and we don't have to. Um, but, <laughs> and so I keep thinking, okay, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I'll do that. But then it doesn't seem to happen. And it's, um, you know, just a challenge over and over and over. But it's always different. And, you know, I, I just don't, I don't want to get caught up in like, well, wait, maybe I should do it that way, or I should do it that way, and just let it unfold as it unfolds. That seems to work the best. Hey, Bob, yeah, that was very good, Robin. <clears throat> it's a very short quote from Baba that I try to remember, and I don't remember where it was from, but I've got it written down. It, it's all going forward, forward, always forward. And I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was something that he said to um, Balna too. It's like a, a river going down to the ocean. Everything is going forward. There are some obstructions along the way, but it's always a going forward. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just to mention here at the end when I when I first got into Baba, I kind of just had Baba within for a couple of years. Then I entered the Baba world. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> I, I lost all of that kind of centeredness in that place I had. And years rolled by and, and it, it was all in me. It all had to come up and everything. And now it's kind of harmonized, much more harmonized in everything. I'm kind of getting back to where I was earlier, but having had to live through a lot of, of you might say, my subconscious uh, just got triggered all along the way for decades, you know. But, like Baba said, uh, you know, uh, it all has a, a beautiful ending. The end is beautiful, Baba said. I, I, I plotted everything, I wrote the script, and he said, I tell you, don't worry, be happy, because it, the end is beautiful. So anyway, any last quote and then we'll take a few moments of silence. Thank you for, you know, sharing all this. And, and like I say, this is the general thing and then he's gonna get into specific things, Darwin is. <clears throat> I can read it small Good. quote. Yeah. It is because of love that I have drawn you all to me. If I did not love you, you would not come to me or care for me. It is not your love that has brought you to me. It is my love that has drawn you to me. Beautiful. I have one short one. Baba yeah. says, if you cannot love me, don't worry. I will be loving you. <laughs> Beautiful. Keep up. J. Baba. So, next um, next two weeks we'll we'll be back delving into effort and grace, and then on the first Sunday <clears throat> of each month, try to come up with a topic. You know that we can uh, weigh in on. Yeah.